Uh oh, where is everybody? <laughs> we only know about us. Oh, it's cold. Nothing to have to do with the clock. No, not at all. All right, good morning. And uh, on behalf of your board of trustees, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Swan Valley. My name is Peter Howe, and I'm on the board. Here on Montreat Road, we're a welcoming congregation. We stand together on the side of love and justice. We walk through this life with open hearts open minds, and hope. Isn't it great to be together this morning? Yes. Let's make the time we spend together today in this place find us braver, more compassionate, and even wiser than when we set out to come here this morning. Page two. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism, you might take note of our mission statement, which is printed on the front of your order of service. We also work together to remote and practice our eight principles, which are printed on the back of the order of service. On this morning and every Sunday morning, as we gather here in this place for committee meetings, for coffee, for meditation, we always need to acknowledge and think about this land where we are now gathered, <coughs> land that has not always been ours to call home and still isn't. That the land we are on today is the ancestral home of the Cherokee and of other indigenous people, and we should never forget their enduring connection to their homeland and this place. Now, okay, you visitors, I'd like to recognize our visitors. There's a visitor right there. We'll start on this side then. Good, good morning. If you could tell us who you are and where you're from. Great. Anybody else on this side? Yes, my Hi. name is Capri Stephen, and I'm from Asheville, and I'm a, a friend of Chris's. Awesome. Oh, oh, Good welcome. to have you here. Anybody else over here? And on to this side. Come on. <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay, nobody visiting on this side. Okay, great. Well, welcome to you all. We're glad that you're here. If you want to learn more about us, or you would like to receive our newsletter, or find out how you can be more involved in this community, there's a white card, or should be a white card, in the back of the pews in front of you for you to fill out and either place in the collection plate or leave on the table in the foyer on your way out so that we can get in touch with you. If there's not a white card in the back of the pew, there should be some on the table outside. Also, you can seek out members of the membership committee they have orange name tags. Andy isn't here to go with his. But if it's an orange name tag, then that's a member of the uh, membership committee, and they can fill you in on anything you might want to know about us and what's going on here. Um, and of course, the website, uusv.org, has more good information as well. Um, if you could take a moment to silence your cell phones, that would be much appreciated. And we will start. Thank you. Thank you. You're up. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Winter won't let go, but it's it's a done deal. It's a done deal. So anyway, good to see you. Um, it's a gorgeous day. It's just a little chilly, and we will we will survive it. Thank you, Diane. Opening words from uh, the late Orlanda Brugnola. I had the pleasure of serving with her at a UU Christian church in in Brooklyn, and she was a very very uh, remarkable uh, UU minister. The flame. Friend of our most ancient ancestors, we kindle you now to make you visible in this time. Yet in truth you burn always in the unique worth of each person, in the imagination, in the turning of the heart from sorrow to joy, in the call to hope, in the call to justice. Burn bright before us, but also 
burn bright within us. <coughs> Wherever Orlando is on her journey, hopefully she is traveling in peace. Please rise as you are able and join in singing our opening hymn this morning, hymn number 38, number 38, Morning Has Broken. Special visiting musician Ruben Orengo, um, incredible violinist. <laughs> Ruben is a retired music teacher from Asheville Middle and Asheville High School, and I know he also directed the string program, and a current member of the Asheville <coughs> Symphony Orchestra. Ruben leads the Latin jazz band Picante. He's a husband to Cheryl, father of two lovely daughters, and abuelo to two lovely grandchildren. <laughs> We're going to start with a show can farewell.
<laughs> I love that song. Wow. Back to work. All right. So, this is the time in the service when we invite you to come up and share a joy and concern. Um, you can use the fire or the stones. Um, wanted to, uh, I was asked to let you know that um, Russ and Molly are hanging in there. Russ has a, a mild case of COVID. He has a lot of fatigue. Of course, he was convalescing from a, I think it was a hip replacement. Right. And um, so I spoke to them this morning and they said to tell you they don't need anything. Um, they appreciate your love and your thoughts and prayers. And um, they asked me to relay that to you. So the floor is yours. This is for those of you who, for whatever reason, decided not to come up. Just know we keep you in our thoughts and prayers and in our hearts and minds. Does anybody need me to bring it to you? Okay. I wanted to share a prayer from First Nations. Uh, I th yeah, this is the Lakota Sioux. I'm going to merge them together because one of them, they have no nation there. Um, and we'll have a time to fly as usual. So. Center yourselves as you usually do. Great Spirit, who dwells in every object, every person, and every place, 
we summon you from the far places into our present awareness. Spirit of the North, who gives wings to the waters of the air and rolls out the snowstorm covering the earth with silver carpet, temper us with toughness to withstand the blizzards of life. Spirit of the East and of the red sun's rising, brace us that we neither neglect our gifts nor lose in laziness the hopes each day affords. Spirit of the South, whose warm breath of compassion dissolves our fears and meets our hatreds, teach us that they who are truly strong are also kind. Spirit of the West and of the sunset, bless us with knowledge of the freedom which follows the well-disciplined life. Spirit of the earth beneath our feet, storer of unreckoned resources, we would give thanks unceasingly to your great bounty. Spirit within, may we be aware of the goodness of the gift of life and be worthy of its priceless privilege. Great Spirit, the star nations all over the heavens are yours, and yours are the grasses of the earth, you are older than all need, older than pain and prayer. Teach us to walk the soft earth as relatives to all that live. <clears throat> and now while our minds are one, I leave you with the eloquence of silence. And so it is. I meant to tell you, I forgot, I'm sorry, that uh, Anselman and Mamie send their greetings and salutations. They are hanging in. They're still in the game, like we all are. Okay. The, uh, the prophet Muhammad reminds us, blessed be he, that we can't want the good for ourselves that we would not want for others. So in that spirit, we collect this morning's offering. Thank you, ladies. Okay, I want to say something before the next tune. I want to thank Linda. She has done an incredible job. She just got the music yesterday. And, and we just had a rehearsal this morning. Right? And, and this song we're going to play next is not that easy. It's a Brazilian song, and it's really complicated. And it requires a lot of people playing, you know, guitars and percussion, and she's awesome. Yes. Thank you. And we've never played this before. <laughs> Together. This <laughs> Thank you. 
It's never done, Larry. <laughs> I have some... Um, Oh, and you said it with such disdain. It <laughs> does sound so disdain. They're very quick. Let me find them. Hold on. I mean, the Oscars are on tonight. You're not going to say that about them. Here's a... Uh, this is... We should stop calling guys who are kind of middle-aged and have... We shouldn't call it dad, a dad's bod. We should call it a father figure. <laughs> How's that? Is that bad? Oh, here's one. What, what, did the, what did the drummer name his twin daughters? And a one and a two. <laughs> oh. Oh, come on now. Stop it. Stop it. Okay, come on. Here's one. A wise man once said that before you embark on a journey of revenge, you should dig two graves, just in case there's a witness. <laughs> oh, come on. It's Lent. <laughs> okay, here we go. You're warmed up now. Long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a time when the self, let's call it the not-self, those who were, who were around us and separate from us, uh, there was a time when the self and the not-self were one. When we were in our infancy, Plato got this from Socrates. Plato was way, well, Socrates was way ahead of his time. And, and so, there was a unity. There was no separation for us. Quantum physics is talking about this now, that we live in a factile universe, that there was a, a um, we just fractured and we left this source and this source is experiencing itself through us. And when we leave, we go back to that source. They don't want to use the word God, but it doesn't matter. But, but you know, Plato knew this 2,500 years ago, as did Socrates. So this is to say that a newborn, as newborns, we did not experience the separation of the universe and ourselves. There was no separation. We know now there's no separation. It's just hard for us to live like that. Socrates, again, said this. And so he said that souls love, both he and Plato believed in God, but they also believed in the gods, which is something I'm not going to go into with you today. But he said that souls lived in the presence of God before they became involved with time and space. Does that make sense? Waiting in line, as it were. And I, when I picture it, I picture like these souls with like parachutes and they're just waiting. I go, Do I have to go to this place again? They jump. I just, I just look at it like that. Something like that. I'm sure it was nothing like that. <laughs> but these souls, before they take the lead, they are in the presence of this consciousness. And they are naked and undisguised. They're just pure energy. There's no hair, no skin color. No, They're just pure beings of light that fractured off from this intelligence. So there were no boundaries. And then when the moment comes to life, says, uh, for life, says Socrates, these souls become involved in bodies and become part of the time-space continuum. Then he goes on to say that everything is knowable. Everything that we need to know is already within us. He, he reminds us of that. And, and so that's why he never thought that he was really teaching anything. He was reminding us of what we already know. And then Plato uh, takes the ball and run with it after Socrates drinks that at Hemlock. So he says, learning is not really learning. Uh, it is recollection. It is remembrance which is one reason why Socrates never charged for his teachings. He never took money for his teachings. 
So anyway, the infant or newborn experiences this oneness and is nurtured by the mother until psychological birth. So we are in unity and we are sustained, if we're lucky, by the love of our mothers, depending on how wounded uh, they were. But as we grew older, we experienced the psychological separation or psychological birth that we needed to grow in the process of what? Of our self-discovery. And as we discovered ourselves, we learned to accept that the acceptance and love from others would never, ever again be as unconditional or as undemanding as before until we leave this body and we go back to this intelligence, this, 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 um, this God energy, as Plato talks about. But now we're here, we're on the planet, maybe we probably may have been here before, and so we long for this unconditional, undemanding unity that we experienced before. We know what that's like on some level, and we long for that. We long for it in our politics. We long for it in our religions and our dreams of utopia. We seek it in our private lives as well, but so often we look for it in all the wrong places. In childhood and adolescence, we seek it among our peer groups, our little groups whose approval becomes even more important than our parents later in life, from our network of friends and coworkers with clearly defined in-groups and out-groups. We seek approval from the larger society, obedient to its rules and conventions on, on how to dress, on how to behave in the appropriate matter, how to vote, mm -hmm. and how to think. Mm -hmm. Our hunger for approval is rarely ever sated, ever. Mm -hmm. Yet there may come a time when we will settle for nothing less than what can only be termed for us individually as our ultimate approval. We shall not be satisfied until we are saying yes with the deepest awareness in ourselves to the deepest, most profound, and most significant thing in this life. Now, some people call this God or, or, or the presence or, or the ancestors, the ground of being, the prime mover, the force, it goes by many names, but it really doesn't matter because it's nameless. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's a nameless mystery. But whatever you call it, it is the ultimate approval of this life. My basic proposition this morning is this, that we, you and I, cannot live comfortably in our minds and in our spirits, if we can indeed live at all without the consciousness of having our lives okayed, sanctioned, nodded to by somebody or something else. That is what I am talking about. Now, there are those who think they can. <clears throat> They believe that they are so much more independent than they think they really are. And there will always be people like that who believe this about themselves. No matter how independent or rebellious or you, you, you think you are, you're really not. You still depend and care. And this is not a bad thing. Please hear it. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm not making a value judgment of it on it at all, but it is true. We must have approval, not at the cost of yourself, though, of your own integrity. I, I, I need you to hear that. Because if you engage too much in outside validation, you will lose the path to yourself. 
So, so that's said. But we must have approval. And perhaps the test of the individual's inward authority is how the individual is able to discern whose approval is worth having and whose <laughs> not. Right? Uh, uh, Bob Marley said that everybody is going to hurt you. Your job is to decide who of those people is worth suffering for. And so, just as it's, my life seems to have a purpose, a, 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 you know, I have a purpose and I have a plan, and I follow some kind of order, some, some kind of logic, that even though my life may seem to be confused and confusing, if I examine it very carefully, I note that in my life there is a structure, there is an intelligence. As I stand at any point and look back upon the days of the weeks, the years that have passed, I see an order in my life. I see an intelligence in my life. Because as Kierkegaard reminds us, life is lived forward, but it can only be understood backwards. Now, it may not be an order of which I'm particularly proud. Well, then again, it may be, but there is a logic in living of my life so that my life is not merely an accident, an accidental expression. And so the mystics tell us that we are surrounded by this logic, this intelligence. You don't need a priest or an imam or a pope or anybody to mediate this energy. Even if you're atheists, you don't need anybody to, to, to mediate, to uh, no, uh, a come-betweener, if you will. And so perhaps, just perhaps, we could argue, one could argue that we are not born, we're not really born human until we are put in a human situation. We can argue that. We actually become human in a situation which there, in which there are other adults. And it is in them that we discover ourselves. It is a great discovery, for instance, when a baby discovers her foot. And this foot is part of her. Or when he or she begins to say, no, I won't. <laughs> or that is mine. It's a time of separation. It's a time of psychological birth. It doesn't mean you're born in sin and you're willful. It is a time when the self begins to emerge. It is a time of, of, of discovery. How do we get back to this notion of oneness? Because all of the dreams of our society, all of the dreams about the kingdom or queendom of God, all the dreams about the beloved community, about this utopia, all of them are but reflections of our desire from the unity out of which we sprang before self-consciousness became possible. There's that longing in us. So it stands that the desire for approval is a natural one. I want you to hear that. It is a natural one. Without the hunger for approval, without the urge for approval, and what it does to the personality when the approval is given, it would not be possible for us to develop and evolve and mature. I stress again, not the desire for approval at all costs, not to be a people pleaser, not to be, well, Michael likes whiskey, so when I'm with him, I like whiskey, but when I'm with Jim, I like Kool-Aid, because Jim <laughs> likes Kool-Aid. It's, it, 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 it's about your authenticity. Not a constant neediness to have to be looked at and approved. That's not what I'm, talk I'm talking about. But approval is needed because the human race, we want approval from somebody 
or something. Now, when we are growing up, we have to have the approval of our peers, our, our posse. And then there came a time when this approval rivaled that of our, our family, except around maybe Christmas time. <laughs> Later on, we needed the approval of society. We, we had to eat a certain way, we had to dress a certain way. And by conforming in this way, we had a sense of belonging. Nothing to be ashamed of here. We got the nod from society, we got the wink, and we belonged. This gave us a certain stability. We were not lepers, we were not outcasts. But then we began to think about how much of ourselves we want to give up in order to belong. And this is not, you know, we, we, you go back and forth. This is not quite my private life, but it's not my public life. And so I'll negotiate it if I can. Approval is what we are all seeking, but the question already, always remains, at what cost? And then the question becomes, how much am I really able to bend and not to break. And so to stay in the group, the question may arise as to how much I want to belong. How much approval do I want? I begin to ask myself, consciously or unconsciously, if I do this certain thing, how will it affect my relationship with my peers, with my in-group, with my congregation, with my partner, with my spouse, with this group, so to speak? We've all experienced the situation where we may say to ourselves, you know, I, I, I'd like to do this particular thing. I really would. It's the right and honorable thing to do. It's the right thing to do. But, but I'm not free to do it. I'm not free to do it. If it were up to me, I'd do it. But I'm not quite free to do it because if I do it, I will cut off. I'll be cut off by some human beings whose approval I think is absolutely essential to my well-being. I, I, Michael, I just, I just can't take the risk. I will be cut off, and I'll be vulnerable emotionally. Now, I can possibly work it out with my conscience, but I may not be able to work it out with the group, so I better stick with the group for now. This is the amazing thing about religion, healthy religion, and or spiritual insight. Because if you look back over the 10, 15, 20 years of your life, you may see that those people whose approval you seek or feel is necessary to your well-being, they have become more and more and more a certain kind of person or human being. That's why it's good to check in every couple decades <laughs> to see if you're still the per same person you were five, ten years ago. If, if these people in your life still mean the same thing, do you really need them in your life? Do they really need you in, in their lives? You may, this may not be true for you, but if it is, you will notice that the people are more and more representing a kind of symbol to you, to your goals of your life, the meaning of your life, the values of your life. You better choose well. Now, the degree to which one seeks approval from these people who symbolize the highest values to which you are loyal, to the extent to which this takes place, you will grow more and more into the likeness of those values the symbols of which you think may believe may be possible or necessary for your peace of mind. You must choose your symbols wisely. You must choose the company you keep wisely. This is because ultimately you will settle for nothing less than ultimate approval. Ultimate, ultimately, for instance, I may give up. I may give up on you, but
but I'll never forgive up on me. Ultimately, I may let you down, but I will not let myself down, not in the long run. This is human nature. I will not be satisfied until I am saying yes with the deepest awareness in me to the deepest, profoundest, and significant thing in my life. So again, religion and spirituality, not always the same thing, but close. They say there is a name for you. There's a name for what he's talking about, but you call it what you will. You recognize this when you pass all of your secondary approvals. And only when you are able to seek approval from what is most important, then you are willing to run the risk of all secondary approval and pretenses. And remember, it doesn't matter what you label it. Because we get caught up as you use. Because those wounds from our religion of origin. I don't want to say God, but I mean God, and then, but that gets mixed up, and then, you know, it's, a, just say what you mean, we'll figure it out, or tell us. Otherwise, you're missing, you're missing out, because you're up here, and you can't get to here from up here. That is why the quest, and that's what I'm talking about here, you call it a journey, but it's a quest is the logical expression of the normal behavior pattern of the individual who, when you're starting to grow in your life. It is your quest, not mine. Not mine. The need for approval is an expression of the search for the human spirit, for the all that is, whatever you conceive that to be. Approval says yes to my quest for growth for evolution. To not attempt this quest is not intelligent. To not attempt this quest for the approval that is beyond all other approvals, you must do it. Take the risk. The ultimate approval is not about what you believe. So that can take some pressure off of you. <laughs> It's not about judgment of your deeds. It's not about your thinking or your behavior as such. It's about you. 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 That's what this is. You are free and then you are home. Even though some days may be heavy, and the nights may be terribly long, even when the disease of my body will not be cured and the crack in my heart cannot be mended. What? Who cares? Because you have lived. Because you have lived. And it is far more important that I have lived and I have been touched than that the problems of my life have been solved. Are you feeling me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. For if I have been touched by life, it gives me confidence to tackle anything because there is only one point at which the word no can be said, and that is if I say it to myself, mm -hmm. if I say no to my own invincible summer. summer. Remember the, the poet uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins in the poem Kingfisher, he says, and again, it's non-logical, but he says, selves goes itself, Myself it speak and spells, crying, this is me, for that I came. Mm. This is me, for that I came. There's a wonderful scene in uh, the Gospel of John, it's 1836 or 37, and Jesus is before Pilate on trial for his life. But when you read it, you wonder, maybe Pilate in Rome is on trial. 
maybe the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Pilate is talking to Jesus and he says, so you say you're a king. And Jesus says, uh, no, that's what you say. <laughs> he says, I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. And we know that the two most important days of our lives are the day we're born and the day we find out why. Mm -hmm. So even in the face of these barbarians, he says, defiantly, no, 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 that's what you say. I'm here to testify to what I think is truth. What are you going to do when someone says that? You've got to crucify them. <laughs> I, what am I supposed to do with this, 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 this insolence, this arrogance? And he may be right. If I am for me, I mean, this is what Socrates did before he drank the hemlock. He was defiant. As a matter of fact, he says, this is how the day ends. I go to die, you go to live. Which is best, I can't tell you. What, what a mind. But if I'm for me, and life is inevitably for me, then of whom and of what should I be afraid? Who should I, what should I fear? For when fear, I mean, I'm just asking you. Because the answer really is no one. Because when fear knocks on the door, and faith answers, when fear knocks on your door and love answers, nobody's there. No, there's nobody there. There's somebody out there. But not. <laughs> Amen. Ashe. I hope and bless him be. Yeah. You're going to say? Yes. Um, we're going to stand for 108, right? So we're not going up and down. Okay. Just stay in your seats until, <laughs> until Linda dismisses you. <laughs> so she dismisses you. So you can hear. <laughs> and there you go. Come on, brother, you're on. No, actually, no. Sing no? him. Sing the hymn. The whole thing. Can you play with I just want everybody to stay seated so they can hear Reuben at the end. Okay. Yeah, Good deal. <laughs> My life flows on, number 108. <laughs>
show them some love. Show yourself some love. You showed up. You turned your clock back. <laughs> May the love which overcomes all differences and which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all of our fears and reconciles all of us who are separated. May that love be with us, in us, and among us now. Have a wonderful afternoon. Yes. I want to pick up a few things. Thank Linda again. You know, normally this song. Well, this song was. Uh, was written by Tito Puente, a Puerto Rican percussionist, but uh, Carlos Santana made it famous all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally when I play with my band, we have two percussion players, a uh, bass player, uh, I mean like six or seven pieces, so it's only two of us. <laughs> and uh, this is a guido, and this is a, it, it, was Af it originated in Africa, and it was made, this is not a, a real gore, but it's made, it's made from real gores, and you know, they hollow it out, and they, so it sounds like this. And they use it a lot of Latin music and African music and everything. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs>